something from a Linux system called the Steam Deck. Oh, there's so much delay. Uh, yeah, it will be nice. It's, a, I think, a 6 or an 8 core CPU, so it's an easy gaming handheld. And now it's running presentation. Uh, yeah, you can follow my blog. Uh, what do I do? So I'm here in Linz to finish my master's degree. Uh, it should be done soonish. So, yeah, end of the year, definitely, probably end of the month. I uh, maintain a couple open source crates. Uh, on the Rust side, you know, maybe have seen Fredpool or Parseint or sudo. I can highly recommend Parseint because it just deals with all the prefixes. Uh, I'm starting a new job tomorrow. That's why I'm moving away from Linz. So. The classical disclaimer, opinions are my own, my employer, TP, uh, they are in the si a similar space, but uh, yeah, don't speak for them today. And in my spare time, I organize another Rust meetup uh, called Zürichsee, which is the lake of Zurich. So all around that lake, there's also talks and Rust Fest. Um, if you want to join the Rust Fest family event, you can in October in Brussels. So in Brussels, it's called eurotrust.eu. Tickets are available, schedule is public. Oh, and book a day early because there will be workshops that have not been announced yet. They have been announced. Oh, ah, cool. So they have been announced. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, let's go to the table, uh, table of contents or not, because I don't think you can read it. And for the people in the stream, you will just get what you get. So let's not waste any time. So continuous integration, CI. It's basically a thing to execute code on another machine. So that's why I highlighted it here. It's a remote code execution. Very important. If you give access to uh, someone with your, uh, to your CI, your CI will just run with the same privileges all over again. And like we had with the Lambda cache attacks, where someone figured out that slash TMP is read-writable for all the Lambda functions, and you can read stuff from other customers. Same is true for continuous integration if it's not set up properly. Uh, and what does that mean, that's set up properly? Well, Docker still runs as root by default, and the default installation is in a Docker container. So your continuous integration job runs as root alongside everybody else. That's why there is Podman, which I can recommend. So you set Podman up and then do the mapping properly, and then it's not root anymore. It's just a user. And of course, you can use uh, Kubernetes, K3S, for instance, and then configure that as the runtime or executor, but I will go over that as well. Uh, why is it so very, very handy? Because it's bundled with the repository. If I have 15 different versions or branches or on pull requests and merge requests and all of the things and small things change, it will always build with the same code, even if I change the CI infrastructure itself. So that's very, very nice. And then we need some advanced features, right? Like we need specific environment variables. We need to have secrets for deployment or for pulling down proprietary data sets. Uh, we have caches sometimes that would be very nice. And we may have artifacts. So the difference between those two is cache is read write and you can manually delete it per repository. And artifacts are outputs that are generally uploaded to something else, like a website, through the GitLab functions. Uh, there are similar stuff on GitHub, but it's called slightly different. And we also have uh, variables in the scheduling. That's basically the templating. Oh, is the mic back on? No, it's not. No? Stefan. Am I gone? When did I clip out? Stefan is not here. Stefan. No. Support. Uh, 
Oh, he walked away with his phone, right? Did it disconnect? No, still connected. <laughs> uh, we're lucky today. We're very lucky. <laughs> so, how far should I backtrack? Can't wait for a third device. <laughs> <laughs> Did we just lose the stream? Okay. So, uh, I, yeah, I was with the uh, templates. So we can have symbols in our YAML file that will that be will interpreted. Be. Yes, I hear myself again. Very good. And another very nice feature is triggering events in different repositories. Uh, sadly, I cannot show that code because it's from one of my clients, but it basically works like this. They have an open source base installation, and whenever CI starts to run on the main, on dev and staging branches, it will send signals to a deployment repository with all the secrets and all the configuration for the production. And that part is very private. So it will just forward a signal, and you can see in the open source version uh, if all your tests work, and then in the closed source part is the deployment. Did it actually deploy to the machine or not? Now, how do we think about stuff? So we have one GitLab CI.yaml file, which is called a pipeline. This is one thing that runs through. Inside that pipeline, we can have stages that are just blocks, and we define the stages in order, and they run in that order. But because that's too easy, there's also another mechanism called depends on. So we have a full dependency graph, which, of course, we can build loops, and then it will crash or just hang. So uh, they have these two mechanisms, I personally like the stages because they're easy, but the graph is also very nice because it draws you a nice picture and it auto hides stuff. And it's very similar to GitHub's matrix where you can tell, make me a matrix over processor architecture and operating system. And then it just wants 16 jobs at once for all the combinations or more. Another thing is we have per GitLab instance. So the web UI that stores the code, we have shared runners and non-shared runners. And if you have code on the public GitLab.com instance, I would recommend just add your own runner to projects that compile often or take long because they reduce the amount of free time you have on the system. Um, yeah. If you don't want to be surprised, if you're close to this limit, it used to be 2,000 minutes per month. I think it's less now. Just add your own system. Let your system run all the, the jobs, and there will be no more surprises. Fun fact, if you have a workstation, uh, you can just run it in a virtual machine on your local machine or in a Docker container on a local machine. If you're the only one that's linked to that runner you trust yourself hopefully <laughs> right then you can just have it running on the background could even be on a laptop and with some smart trickery you could set it up in a fashion that the runner would not run when it's unplugged from the power for instance so when you code on the go and then go home to your office just plug the machine in and it will realize oh now i can process the queue and it will run all your CI. GitLab is smart enough to recognize uh, when a job is no longer needed. So let's say you have a branch and you add five commits to it. It will not run all five commits, just the last one, unless you tell it to. But usually it's, it's good enough to, to run the last one. All right. So costs, last talk had it uh, as well. On the public instance, we have one hour limit and low, uh, lower priority compared to the paid plan, which is 30 euros, a little less per user per month. Um, 
if we compare that to some some random VM, which is like five euros a month, and looking at it for like half an hour every month to just to apply updates for unlimited amount of users, it's a pretty easy sell even to your boss. Disk space, just put something that has more than five gigabytes. 10 is probably tight, 50, good enough. Networking is usually free with servers and uh, yeah, because you usually pay for outgoing traffic. And uh, a GitLab runner is usually pulling a lot of data in. So inbound traffic is usually free with all the servers. So that's very nice. And for caching, you can use an S3 compatible storage. Don't have to use AWS. Oh, and if you use AWS, uh, be aware that they charge you for traffic within their data centers if the data centers are in different zones, and that can be very expensive. Just, yeah, be aware of that. So, so another project where I advise sometimes now is, is uh, trapped because they have a lot of storage in one bucket and another huge lot in another one and they cannot synchronize them anymore so they just manually synchronize stuff that they notice is wrong but yeah they cannot afford to just download both sides compare and fix it automatically because it's a couple terabytes and it's just very expensive another thing privacy safety security deployment keys is a good thing license keys another thing uh, sometimes you're not even allowed to run certain software on certain CPUs. So if you, for instance, have a, I don't know, Adobe license that is for 16 cores and the shared cloud spawns you on a 64 or 96 core machines, you suddenly breach of license it would be really hard to blame you for that, but kind of eh, just put some old box in, in the corner and let that run it. Yeah, doing stuff local, self-hosting, yay. So here we see a uh, typical flow from the runner's perspective, and it's all HTTP. Who, who remembers long polling? Oh, a couple. So for the young ones, this is before WebSockets was a thing. Yeah. So, and sadly, it still works. <laughs> it's still needed. Uh, yeah, so long polling uses the TCP timeout, which is still 30 seconds. So it waits 25 seconds, and if there's no data, the server will reply with no data, and then the client will poll again. And do that over and over until there is data, and there is a chance that instead of waiting 30 seconds for the, an event that happens on the server side, we wait 10 seconds and then we're 20 seconds faster. It's still slower than WebSockets because we have to reconnect all the time, but yeah, that's the thing. Uh, the right side, the far right side is the executor. That's communication that depends on the plugin. And what plugins are these? Yeah, it's usually Docker. Let's be honest. Most people run it uh, as a Docker container or have it as a systemd service, which I personally find very handy. Because with systemd, we can restrict the service a little more without touching the service itself. So we can, for instance, say private temp. So the service no longer sees slash TMP from the system, but it's locked away in some random directory that will change every restart. The service won't see it. We can also restrict uh, the capabilities, although to be fair, it doesn't make much sense because most of the capabilities like reading, writing, and network connections are needed, and that's usually the dangerous stuff. Oh. Yes, someone moved an umbrella. So, if we add this, we can also make an Ansible role. Probably can't read it. Don't worry. So it's, it's installing an GPG key and then adds app. Let me scroll down then enables the system D service and then whoop, we add the repository as well 
you see this is uh, distribution dependent so when you are on testing for instance like debian testing or the, i don't remember what the ubuntu leading edge is called there is a chance that when the testing name gets announced your updates will fail for a couple of weeks until uh, GitLab itself has a new folder. So you can also hard code the distribution release or override it. Ansible is highly customizable, sometimes a little bit too much, and you can override almost anything. So the executors. So the first two, SSH and Shell, are the most dangerous, basically. Because it is what it is. It just opens a shell, either remotely or locally, and just executes whatever is in this YAML file. And that one is not contained at all. So no matter what branch, it will just execute the code. Um, you shouldn't use that unless you have 100% control and don't accept any untrusted merge requests at all. Another one is Parallels or VirtualBox, where you spawn a virtual machine. There used to be one for KVM, but it was discontinued, sadly. There was also one for Xen, also discontinued. There is the Docker one. And if you just symlink the Docker binary to Podman, you don't have to worry about anything because Podman is API compatible. And there is a Docker machine plugin, which is the same as Docker, but just starts a VM first. That one is really handy, but it's experimental, sadly. And um, yeah. And of course, we have the Kubernetes one. And Kubernetes is great because you already have namespaces and whatnot. And yeah, the only downside is we have to run Kubernetes somewhere and have all the ingress and auto, blah, blah, blah. So for small installation, Docker is probably fine. Yes. So let's look at some code. This is from the sudo project. The sudo is one crate, one library, nothing fancy. Can you read it in the sunlight? OK, nice. Uh, image is a Docker image. And when uh, Docker Hub announced that they would charge for stuff and just throw everything over whatever, I was a little worried because I would have to update all these image paths like everywhere. They reversed the decision, luckily, because, yeah, it was very, very stupid idea. And then, yeah, you use the image. The image on the top level is the image for all the jobs. We can overwrite per job as well. And then we have a test stage, which is the first part, is here, and then some name. This syntax has been deprecated, so now it will just reinterpret it as test colon cargo. Well, it works. It's just one stage. That's all it is. I recommend outputting the compiler versions, no matter what language. And if you use Node, just say Node dash dash version or Java or whatever. Just print it. It will be logged. And then you have a much easier time figuring out why some feature is broken or it gives you random errors or invalid syntax to check if the version is correct. Then we run a test. That's yeah, what it is. This one is in debug mode. And then, uh, last but not least, we test all the example code because this repository uh, basically has a lot of example code because it cannot test it otherwise. So, yeah. It is what it is. If you have questions, just like shout. I will skim the stream now. No uh, yeah. yeah, just some ad for Hetzner. I don't like Hetzner personally. <laughs> <laughs> they have an anti tor policy, or at least had one. Yeah. Use IP projects or ungleich.ch. If you want to be CO2 neutral, then you can host your stuff in the Swiss Alps. Yeah, it's running of water power, so it's nice. <laughs> okay, next example, parse int. Parse int is a little bit more complicated because we have features now, and we have nightly. The difference between nightly and not nightly is the image line. So we just add, whoops. Oh, come on, double click. You add a tag nightly at the end. That's it. 
that's how we change images. And for features, we just run the test without flags and with flags. Yeah, it's not that not that hard, right? It's, it's, it's good to do. We can, of course, do more stuff. So this is from my master thesis. And here I use a different image. So I don't use the stock compiler. I use something that I built myself. This here. So we change the registry as well. I'm hosting this one on GitLab. And I use JUnify because that allows me to uh, print test coverage, like how many lines are covered in the test. Then for actual test coverage, again, printing the Rust version, testing the whole workspace. This workspace flag is very handy. So, because it will tell Cargo, yeah, yeah, go search, go deep, test all the things. And then we can modify the output format. You can see here we have, whoops, JSON. Then we have unstable options. That's why different compiler report timings, and then here's a normal shell pipe. Oh yeah, and these little squiggles at the end, it's just new lines that I had to insert because it wouldn't fit on the slide. And then we calculate coverage by just running a normal build and then have LLVM coverage do the actual coverage reporting. But yeah, we need to have the tests running first because LLVM coverage will uh, fail weirdly if the Rust code is somehow unsustainable. Like if you have syntax errors just in the tests, it will compile under normal circumstances, but then the coverage will fail because there's an error in the test. So we need to run the tests first and then build again. But hey, the CI does it. We will never forget it and it will just work. And remember the artifacts? This is an artifact. So the output of the artifact is uh, some XML. And sadly, the latest version of GitLab broke this a little bit. I haven't fixed it yet. But you could just tell it, here's the report template for JUnit, which is a Java testing framework. But, ah, XML is XML. Just look into that folder, pull it out, and then add it to the branch. Yeah, I will fix that at some point. There is other formats. I uh, don't remember. I think four or five different coverage formats are supported. Hmm? Maybe. I don't remember. Yeah. But you can find it in the docs which ones are supported. Now, uh, another example is Color Blinder. It's, it's a tool I wrote a couple years ago to simulate color blindness and different kinds. And then it will output a picture or a bunch of pictures or a combined picture, whatever you like. And for the pure Rust version, it's fine, just like sudo. But for the UI, for the GTK version, we need some dependencies. And now we have this before script. And this one will get run before every job. And I use that to set up the environment. It's Debian based, which is very nice. So we'll just tell update, upgrade, and then install. And then this is very handy. Install no recommends. So we don't get extra stuff we don't need. Just gives the smallest footprint. And smallest footprint means faster download times, faster runtime for the container. And then we install the libraries we need, like Pango and GTK3. Should update that to GTK4 at some point. And then we just run our normal script, just cargo test workspace. There you go. And it just runs through. And of course, we can play with stuff. So one of the additional features is deployment. And yeah, I have heard of pages probably. Yeah, GitHub has it, GitLab has it. It's a static site hosting service that's integrated into the hosting platforms. And the plugin is called Pages. So we just have to call the job Pages and put it in a stage deploy. And then whatever we copy into this public folder will get transferred out. Or we have to mark it as an artifact. 
And the plugin will then just look for this public folder in the artifacts and then put that onto the web server. Uh, it used to have some bugs. For instance, when uh, you would trash the web service, it would just be empty. And then you had to rerun all the jobs. But that's pretty easy. You just go into the latest one, and then there's a little icon. Just press it, and it runs the job again. And the nice thing is it will run it at the same commit with the same environment. It will be very much the same. Unless we pull something from the outside, like time or downloads, it will output the same result in the end. Oh, um, before I forget, this only is a list of branches where we say we upload the artifact only on the main branch or the release branch. I used to do some magic with regex and searching for a git tag and whatnot because it also runs it on git tags. But it's hard and the syntax changed and this is way more reliable. And then we just have to protect the main branch and then push to main branch only with merge requests and then we have release management as well. So, how do we deploy? Stage zero is setting up some sort of trust, right? And SSH is really great for that because we can have verification in two ways. So we have one token, it's the SSH deploy token. This is basically a private key, which we can generate on our machine with SSH key again. And the output of that will be the value. It's just a one-liner, and it will be saved in. The other side is the server. Right? We don't have, uh, uh, how is it called? The X509, the TLS trust chain, right? So we don't have that. We don't have a trust anchor with SSH. So we just ship it ourselves. We just record the known host files, put it into the environment, save. And then uh, we are ready. We have another script. Again, just set it up. We install rsync, we install SSH, we create the folder, we uh, place them in there. This is an old script because in the beginning you could only have environment variables. Nowadays you can have files, but it's a little tricky if the folder doesn't exist. So I still keep it that way. Then we change the, the access permissions. Then we have some make deploy. This can be whatever. Uh, in the project, in this specific one, I use make files because I have a lot of reoccurring symbols. So I use make files templating as well. And then in the end, I just remove it. And this might sound silly because the container should get deleted, but with any garbage collection, there's no timing guarantees. It will delete it at some point, maybe next year, right? We just don't know. So I just delete the private key from the container. It will be, still be findable on the physical disk or the virtual disk, but it will be much harder than just opening the directory and there it is. So how much speed up can we get if we enable the cache? Yes, we do. Uh, the caching, yeah, it's actually this slide. <laughs> yes, so Rust is, is a little bit tricky to cache in, in the beginning because you have the target and the registry. Right. So the target is our build artifacts and the registry is all the dependencies and the index as well. Um, if you have Rust version 167 and older, it will copy the whole registry all the time. And that one, I don't know how big it is, but it's a couple hundred megabytes. So it will just download the index all the time and then all the dependencies also, which is great for your stats on uh, crates.io, but it's really slow. So on a big project I had with Actix, it just was pulling 15 minutes uh, of dependencies and then building because it had the debug cache already and testing everything it was just three minutes of that so enabling registry cache with this handy little sim link what no doesn't want to triple click this one 
it's a little hacky, but it works great. So it just say here, move that into before script is important because if we don't do it, the cargo command will already have created the structure. And with this, it will be redirected in our cache. So that's very nice. We could also cache the release binary, right? But I use that for deployment. And there's some weird bugs sometimes with caches on release mode. And I want to have a reliable deployment. And I don't deploy every commit. Maybe I deploy every fifth commit or something. So I rather wait the full uh, build for release mode which is, I think, nine-ish minutes. Yeah, the other one is the release mode, yeah. Nine minutes instead of 20. Still good, still an improvement by 50%, but I don't have weird artifacts and I don't have weird errors on runtime. Yeah, does that answer the chat question? Mm, I think... Mm -hmm. <laughs> great, great. Yeah, I see uh, GitLab. Uh, yeah, GitLab has great runners in general, but they run in the Google Cloud, and I don't trust the Google Cloud. Uh, so, yeah, I, I won't use them. But sometimes it's funny. If you have a runner on old disks and not enough RAM, it will be very slow because the disks are just slow. And sometimes you notice weird lags in the log, and that's when there is a flush somewhere. So if any part of the whole chain does a flush, like pip does at the end of installing dependencies, or some programs do it when they crash, they write the core dump and then they flush. So you get weird timing artifacts in the environment. So. I think we waited half a minute and I don't see anything. Oh, uh, yeah. Moving on. So, an S3 cache bucket. Uh, GitLab has a very good retention policy for artifacts. It's just 30 days and the latest one. So, we don't have to worry about that unless we deploy to production like 50 times an hour. It just works, right? Give it a little breathing room and it will clean up after itself. For the cache, it's not so clear, but it's a cache. So as long as the transfers are complete, right? So what I mean is when, when the client starts pulling a cache file, as long as the client receives the cache file fully, it will be fine if we delete it right after. Because the client will, uh, client means runners, the runners will just search according to a scheme on this S3 pocket, is there a cache for this repository, for this job? We can even add our own mechanisms and templates for this pattern. If it doesn't find it, it will just create a new one. And if it finds it, it will download it and then overwrite it when the job is over. Plus, we can manually uh, clear. Yes. Yeah, so the question was, why create a remote cache and not a local cache? It's a very good question. In the beginning, you could do that. So I had a folder slash cache, and I would just throw everything into that one. I don't know why. That's probably to do with the Kubernetes support, but I don't know. I'm also a little sad because now I would have to run another service just for the cache, which seems silly. So. Yeah, currently I'm not caching for most of my stuff. It's just the stuff that's already public so, uh, open source code anyways that uses the cache and everything else just takes longer. <laughs> yes, another question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, backing up the cache at the end and redeploying it to the runner. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, so someone from the audience had uh, their own experience with caching, and apparently, caching all the things took longer than the game was with the cache. Yeah, uh, sad, but yeah. <laughs> was NTFS involved with any of that? Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you run NTFS and lots of small files, you will be sad. So uh, Microsoft's latest recommendation is use their new file system, the ReFS, in a second partition because you cannot boot from that currently. It's supported in Windows 10 with the latest service pack. I mean, what's it called now? It's not service pack. Uh, yeah, and Windows 11 supports it too, and the server as well, the latest one. Oh, okay, so. Of course not the home edition. We're just talking to professionals. I mean, where would you be if the education edition was still the same feature set as the Pro, right? It is not. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe they changed that back, but we'll see. If we run Linux, then a very popular Minio. Uh, it's just one binary. Just download it, uh, configure it. Please set a password if you do it. Like, don't be like the CIA that loses uh, lots of spy data over an S3 bucket, or the TSA which loses the no-fly list over an S3 bucket. Uh, yeah, and so many others. Yeah, please set the password. We don't need another FTP leak. Oh, it doesn't scroll. Sad. Okay. Uh, we can influence the cache, by the way, in the steps in our repository. So we can say for the deployment cache, we use a different pattern than for the testing path. Right? So we can prefix stuff if we want to. Uh, otherwise, all jobs in one repository share the cache. But as I said before, I would not cache uh, production releases anyway. So yeah, but you can. So, conclusions, yeah. In my opinion, running a runner is very low effort. It just works. You get updates every now and then, but I have never had any trouble. Uh, manage the S3 if you want. See if it even brings you any benefits. We'll see. And most of the stuff I told you it works for any system, right? like GitHub's or I'm pretty sure IBM has their own stuff. Yeah, and if there is no more questions, then I think we made it. We have more questions. <laughs>